Welcome to Bitcoins and Gravy, episode number 47. At the time of this recording, Bitcoins are trading at $325. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Now that's gravy. Welcome to Bitcoins and Gravy, and thanks for joining me today as I podcast from East Nashville, Tennessee, with my trusty dog, Maxwell, by my side. Say hello, Maxwell. We're two Bitcoin enthusiasts who love talking about Bitcoins and sharing what we learn with you, the listener. Thank you so much for listening, and we hope you enjoy the show. On today's show, I am very happy to be speaking with Matthew Bivens of Chicago, Illinois. Matthew is a web developer, an actor, and a former member of the totally crypto band Jump Little Children. Matthew and I talk about everything under the sun, including traffic in Chicago, helping kids learn how to read better, tipping content creators using Bitcoin, and his career as a rock and roll star who was right there when the music industry started falling apart. All right, so today on the show, I am very happy to be talking with a guy in Chicago who is a good friend of mine, Matthew Bivens. He is a web developer, a musician, and an actor. He is the quintessential renaissance man. Matthew Bivens, welcome to Bitcoins and Gravy. Thank you so much, John. It's great to be here. Yes, sir. Now, you told me you had a hellish ride home. Is that right? <laughs> I, I did. It's, um, it's Chicago, and it's Chicago traffic, and the, <laughs> the weirdest thing about it I mean, I think I think any rush hour traffic is bad, but I think Chicago has some of the weirdest. You know, it's just like you never know when it's going to hit. But uh, yeah, people, people just want to get home, want to yeah. get to their bourbons, you know. I remember the last time I drove up there years ago, and I've been since, but the last time I drove up there, and I remember coming into the city and it was like I was part of a symphony. Everybody knew how to drive really well and the changing of lanes. I felt like it, <laughs> I felt like it ought, to, ought to have been put to music. It was so nice C coming from Nashville where you have so many different people from all over the place that nobody right. knows how anybody else drives. Yes. I, I, I have <laughs> definitely had to adjust learning to drive and, and my wife who's a Chicagoan by birth and she's had to teach me the rules of the road because they're real different. They're real different. <laughs> that is funny, man. Cool. Yeah. All right. So we had a great conversation the other day when you were in Nashville and you get to yeah. Nashville every once in a while. Is that right? I do. I do try. I do definitely try as much as I can. What first brought you to Nashville? I was in a rock band. The rock band was called Jump Little Children. And at one point, especially we had our manager, our our lawyer, our booking agent, our publisher, <laughs> pretty much every every business that you could imagine a, a rock band have was in Nashville. So it was wow. our second home, basically. Nice. Um, which is great, which was great. And that was called Jump Little Children. Jump Little Children was the name of the band. Yeah. Cool, man. I've got to check that out. I've got to look that up. And uh, what kind of stuff did you guys do? We were, um, we went to art school, so we thought, you know, we thought of ourselves as art rockers. <laughs> <laughs> nice. uh, basically, what, what that meant is that we, we had a cellist in the band, an upright bass player, and I played accordion and, and harmonica, and and then we, you know, we we were inspired by bands like uh, Radiohead and, and Jeff Buckley and, nice. you know, the Beatles, usual yeah. art art pop stuff you know? yeah man i think you ought to put the band <laughs> back together man i'd love to hear you guys i'd love to hear something like that in nashville it's it's been 10 years actually and uh there is there there has been talk about a 10-year reunion no we loved it we played the exit in all the time and and then we would do um we loved lightning 100 oh yeah just loved it and then and I apparently still it is it's one of the only um, non corporate owned radio stations in the country and and so we do third in Lindsley which was really fun and we had a great time in Nashville. Nice, you know, you, you yeah. mentioned non corporate owned radio stations. The new station here is called Hippie Radio, right? Hippie <laughs> Radio, and they're playing all kinds of things from the '60s and '70s. And I'm hearing songs that I haven't heard since i mean really since 1973 it's killing me i wake up in the morning to hippie radio wow. and uh, and they're non-corporate owned which is totally cool so they actually have djs and you really get the feeling that they're that they're actually choosing what tracks they want to play what records they want to spin i'm really in love with it man i feel like i'm listening to radio back when i was a kid before it got corporate and before the whole takeover and all of that and i, yeah. I know you have an interest in music being decentralized right i do i do and i i always have and it i i think part of that stems from the the fact that when the band started, 
Clear Channel didn't own every single radio <laughs> station. And, and that you could walk. I mean, we... We got our break because we were playing on the streets. We we were buskers, mm -hmm. and somebody from the radio station walked by and said, "Oh, cool! You should come in and just play live on air. Wow. Just play." <laughs> and then they recorded that, and they had the right and the ability to play that recording. Yeah, and it did well, and that you know the rest was history. And and it, gosh, that that changed so quickly. Yeah, and and it was so disheartening because it. You know, it changed the entire music industry. Um, what, what year was that when you guys were busking and the, you got played on the radio? That was 90, uh, 94, 95. 94, 95, right at the beginning of the internet, really. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That exactly. damn internet. That damn internet ruined everything. Then. <laughs> <laughs> but on the on the flip side, though, when we got signed and we went and saw their quote unquote web division and how how backwards everything was, mm -hmm. all of that had to go away. And we could, you know, you could see the writing on the wall that it was it was being dismantled as as we were walking the halls of you know Atlantic. That it was just not going to. They were not keeping up. Wow. So on the on the flip side, the internet has has been an amazing thing for bands that would never get signed, never get signed. Right. And, and they have fans and they get to go on tour eventually. And so it's, but yeah, it's, you know, I definitely, I'm into the idea. Uh, I mean, yeah, decentralization. Yeah. Decentralization. There are a number of people I've interviewed and, um, uh it's fairly often in the Bitcoin world, you'll see an article about some platform that's being built, some company and some startup that has something to do with decentralizing music and then decentralizing writing, decentralizing yeah. content of, of any kind, right? And then I know that you have a strong interest in tipping using digital currency, right? Yeah. Of course, you've got things like PayPal that has been serving the internet community for, for a while, but, but it's just not quite it's not really the norm i mean i was into this idea that, that you were talking about of it becoming part of of watching anything watching any content like if you enjoyed something it becomes the it becomes a thing that you do if you don't like it then you don't tip it's just like a great meal i mean how happy are you when you sit down and and you have a great meal and then you leave and and you're like wow that waiter was amazing while wow, the food was fantastic they deserve it or yeah. just as similarly i i'm a coder as well and so if i, if I find a, someone who has helped me or, or written a plug-in or or really anything that that has gotten me from point a to point b if they have any way to to buy them a coffee or a beer or something i'm gonna do it i just i think the people want yeah. to do that yeah. i think they want to do it absolutely so when you read something that you really like or you get a little piece of code that you can use that helps you in some way you said it just right i think you want to buy them a cup of coffee or you want to buy them a beer now yeah. obviously you know if you <laughs> if you did that 10 times a week you know a beer, <laughs> your average beer these days if you're out someplace costs five bucks you can also get a bottle of beer for a couple bucks so what, what do you think is the appropriate tip you know for instance if you go to watchmybit.com which is the upcoming YouTube, I guess, that's going to allow people to tip using Bitcoin. And it's not going to have any commercials on it, which is what everybody really wants. So you go to watch my bit and you watch somebody um, busking on the street and they play a song and you really like it. What do you really feel like tipping them if you really enjoyed it? Nowadays, I think, in, in, the, in the current mindset, I, a dollar or two, I mean, it dep depending on, you know, just a sort of a, a, a regular tip for something. I mean, if you... A busker, for example. Yeah. I, I will give a couple of bucks if if uh, I think that they're good. I, I've done a lot of busking, and I know that every dollar counts. And that's the thing. It's the mindset that, that would have to change. Like, what if you could make it so easy to tip that everybody would be doing so? And so you could tip 10 cents, or you could tip, mm -hmm. you know, 50 cents, something that anybody could afford, and it would still help. Yeah. But but if you're, you know, the cream would rise to the top as it ends up doing. And I think you could still like, I don't know, make a living almost. Yeah. I mean, the little guys. <laughs> the dream. <laughs> yeah. The little guys. I mean, maybe you have a video there on Watch My Bit or whatever. And mm -hmm. maybe you only get of a given week 20 different people listening. But maybe 20 of those people gave a dollar or gave 50 cents. Hey, that's pretty good. You know, that's, yeah. not, that's not bad tips for the week considering that you're not actually out there doing it. You've done it. It's there. It's living there. It can be a little bit of income. And then like you said, cream rises to the top. Those people are going to, you never know, man, you know, 10,000 people tip them 50 cents each. 
yeah. in a month, that's some good money. Then they can go record their second album or their first album. Absolutely. You know, and they can really do something with it. I envision something like, you know, when you use Square, right? You can add a 10% tip, a 15% tip, a 20% yeah. tip, something like that. I think that Watch My Bit or any of these other, because I know Reddit is coming out with Reddit notes, I think sometime near the end of 2015. So, you know, I imagine those Reddit notes are going to be the currency that they use for tipping. But, you know, there also may be a way, I'm guessing, because they were still developing it, uh, they just came out with the announcement. So I'm guessing there will be some way that you will be able to earn Reddit notes besides just you know buying them from an exchange. So that'd be neat if you could earn Reddit notes and then also tip with Reddit notes. And then, of course, there'd have to be an exchange where you could exchange your Reddit notes in for you know LTB or LTC or Bitcoin or sure. Litecoin or something like that. But yeah, I love the idea that you would have oh. right there on the page, you know, tip a penny, a nickel, yeah. a dime, a quarter, a dollar, and then you just click on that button, it would immediately do it through your computer because you'd have the app set up. Yeah. I love that idea, man. That's fascinating. I didn't know that that was happening, the Reddit thing. That's really, really interesting. Uh, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. That would be, that would just be so neat. <laughs> well, I just read about it today. <laughs> okay. Wow. So you still do any music there in Chicago? What are you doing now as far as your creative side besides the tech side? Uh, that's funny that you say that um, I haven't been officially busking in a while, but uh, some friends and, and I, a sort of a, a gaggle of musicians and actors and, and both, are have have been going Christmas caroling. Nice. Was, wassailing. Yes. Uh, so that's been really fun. And I had a, a, a monthly sort of uh gig here uh and then the leader of the um it was a really neat uh live talk show sort of thing um and we were his we were his like uh uh paul schaefer band yeah, you know, yeah. orchestra and uh he's moving to new orleans so uh i have to come up with something new for the new year I yeah do. man i love yeah. the caroling though now when you guys go around are you going to people's houses you know or are you going randomly through neighborhoods and and scaring people. <laughs> <laughs> I think scaring is the operative word there because uh, this is Chicago. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Just kidding, mom. <laughs> Chicago's really safe. No, I mean, no, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's a lot more fun when you have friends, especially friends who are having Christmas parties already. And so the, the idea of wassailing is that you go to their house and you sing until they give you drinks. Yes, that's really cool. Fun. Now, when you yeah. guys are caroling, are you actually doing you know, the traditional four-part harmony or more, or are you just trying to just sing the song out all in unison? Well, we're doing harmonies where we have, uh, I bring my accordion and mandolin, and we've got a guitar player. M minimal instrumentation, but but yeah, we just, you know, there was a guy, there was like a, a group of seven of us last week, and it's pretty corally thick. Yeah, <laughs> and oh, that's nice great. Way. That's yeah. great, man. You know, Nashville has some caroling, and I've not been out with any group, and I do love caroling. I do love... Christmas carols, and I would love to be there in Chicago doing that with you guys. That would be so much fun, man. Gosh darn Anytime. it. You know, it seems to me like people, I'm, I'm not sure if this is true, man, but it seems to me like people in Chicago have more balls than, than people in Nashville. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is supposed to be Music City, and you do see people busking out on the streets here, but, you know, from what I've seen in Chicago, the times I've been there, and other big cities, man, some of those street performers, they just got balls, man. They're just, there's some wildness there. There's some uh, risque behavior there, yeah. um, and in terms of what goes on in the clubs and everything that I just don't see here. This is kind of a timid, you know, I think it is because we're in the Bible Belt here. I would say. So now let me ask you, when did you first start getting into Bitcoin or what's your association? I know my listeners are wondering, these guys are talking about <laughs> Chicago and these guys are talking about Nashville. What right. the hell does this have to do with Bitcoin? <laughs> Right. <laughs> exactly. Um, well, I think it kind of goes back to two things. Number one, that I am a developer and that the, the Bitcoin community is just super strong with developers. I think three years ago was not the first time I'd ever heard of Bitcoin, but three years ago was, was the first time that I realized that everyone around me was talking about it. A lot of uh, developer communities, you have sort of a weekly um, training. You sort of teach each other new things. And one, one week we had a... Um, we had like an hour on Bitcoin and so on and so forth. So just that's one part of it. And then the second part of it is what we talked about a little earlier. It's just the idea of, of finding a currency and a part of everyday life that is so easy. People are on their computers or phones more and more every day, of course. And if you had something that was, that was just so easy to go from A to B, you could tip anyone and you could 
you could appreciate anything and you could buy things. You know, that's so it's just a fascinating. Yeah. It's just a fascinating, I mean, as you know, of course, it's just a fascinating <laughs> thing, you know. Now, what do you do in tech, actually? Tell our listeners exactly what you do in the world of tech. I'm a front-end developer, which means I take, uh, I'm sort of the in, in between uh, the designer and the, and the back-end guys who who have to do all the functionality. And I do some functionality, but a lot of the aesthetic of how a website looks. Now I work for this for this company that builds apps for kids uh, to help them learn how to read. It's really an amazing feeling to be able to wake up and, and realize that what you're building right now is actively helping a child. You can write a line of code here and then know that the end result is that these kids are reading a little bit better. Is that an app for tablets, for things that children would be using, for computers? How does that work? It's for um, tablets, and it's a browser-based app as well. It's a very specific methodology and a very specific program. So the company goes into schools and makes relationships and, and does some teaching of, of this methodology, and then you put it into practice with our tech. So uh, it's been exciting. It's been a pretty exciting year, and it's next year is going to be pretty intense, but I think it's going to be great. Now, is that specifically, or is that all that the company you work for does? Yes. I mean, within that, there's many different branches of this methodology, of this concept uh, of the specific way that children read. And they've, they've discovered that, you know, sounding out words uh, letter by letter, it's just not really the way to go. That you want to chunk words together, you know, which sounds obvious to us, but when you're four, you don't really <laughs> know that, and you you have to work it out. And I think some kids come to it naturally, and then some just have no concept of this this chunking, this separating things from onsets and rhymes and putting them together. Um, that sounds really neat. Now, are you at liberty to talk about the company and to talk about the name of the product and the apps and all that? Of course. It's called Innovations for Learning. The company builds relationships between corporations, usually. They'll have employees from these large companies spend half an hour a week in, in a portal, a web portal that we've built. And the other end of that portal is a kid. And there are games and there are stories that they read together. And this works really well in, in classrooms where the teacher-student ratio is more like 1 to 30. Mm -hmm. Instead of 1 to 12, which it should be. Right. So these kids get read to, and they get to read as well. And so they're, you know, they are not being left behind because the kindness of strangers is providing that extra time that they need to, you know, practice reading. I think it's a great thing. Anytime you can help kids learn to read. And obviously one of the best ways is just to read to them when they're little, right? Read to them mm -hmm. from the time they're born, even if it's just the you know, the fluffy bunny and the whatever, you know, just the of act of reading. They can tell you're reading. I remember my nieces when they were little, they've all grown up now, but uh, my mom would be reading a book to them and they would have the, they couldn't read yet, but they would have the whole book memorized, which was, right. which was totally cool. So they could actually sit there by themselves and they could read read it back to her, even though they weren't reading. <laughs> yeah. I thought that was really cool. But yeah, so I love the idea of that. Now, tell me the name of the company again. Innovations for Learning. Innovations for Learning. And you yeah. mentioned, you did mention a website that people could go to. Yes. The main branch of the sort of the umbrella of site is innovationsforlearning.org. Okay. And, and then the the app that we've been working on for this half of a year is, is TutorMate. TutorMate.org. So yeah, it's it's uh it's pretty it's pretty exciting, and so next year will be will be pretty exciting as well. I'm trying to figure out how to incorporate Bitcoin into that. I know. Somehow. I know. <laughs> I was thinking the same thing, but again, I, for your listeners who are still trying to figure out why I'm on this show, it's just <laughs> that relationship that technology can bring that wasn't there before. That ability to share blank mm -hmm. that did not exist in 1994 when my rock band started, you know, right. that that has changed everything in those 20 years. And the fact that there's a technology called WebSockets that we brought to this company, they were having a problem syncing the stories from the tutor side to the kid side. And they were doing it in, in a very um, sort of old school way, you know, send a, uh, a bit of data up to the database in the cloud, and then it has to go through all these things. And WebSockets sort of just skips the middleman kind of thing. It's just a, a newer technology. And I think I'm always fascinated by stuff that is going to make these things more human. Yeah. You know, you as a human being, you expect to be able to wake up in the morning, get out of bed, 
physically go make your coffee. These are things that become, you know, muscle memory. Yeah. And I, I feel like there's like a new goal seems to be in the tech world, at least this internet of things where I really think that the goal is to make some of this tech muscle memory. You talk about muscle memory, and I wonder what do we have now stored in our muscle memory that we're used to? You know, you're used to working your way through that stack of bills every month, and you're used to going online and paying now, or you're used to putting the stamps on there, you're used to checking your account this way, you're used to purchasing a car this way, or, you know, having a real estate contract that works this way, this way, and this way. And we're just used to so many things, uh, paying our taxes this way. You know, we really have been kind of led toward a muscle memory that is really not very human and it is you know moving more toward I feel like more toward a corporate mentality so that I mean I envision a future where you have people just going into their cubicles but you know in a way that's a little bit less human than it is now and then you have people getting their paychecks that's a little bit less human than it is now and you know right now I tell people that have children I say hey you think it's bad to complain about taxes because I've heard people hear me complain about how we're overtaxed and they say well we're supposed to pay taxes i say well i know we're supposed to pay taxes anybody would agree with that you know just enough so that we're helping out but there are some people that are in the 50 percent tax bracket and i've said to parents of children i've said imagine if 20 years from now your child is in the 90 percent tax bracket because the the way things are going you could have a 90 percent tax bracket you work your job in the cubicle and you just happen to make enough so that you're in the 90 percent tax bracket and you know basically that means you're enslaved (laughs) you didn't see it coming and you didn't you know everybody recommended you take those business courses in college and you get out and your debt for college is let's say a quarter of a million dollars you know which it could be it could. <laughs> right? I mean, I'm, yeah. Well, those things scare me. And then, you know, the concept of debtor's prison. Could we have debtor's prison? Well, you know, you can no longer graduate from college and just declare bankruptcy like people used to do, right? You can't do that anymore, which is probably a good thing. You know, it means that people need to think a little bit further down the road and be a little bit more responsible. But, uh, yeah, I just, you know, I really do fear um, the corporatization of this country, you know, of the world. But, you know, I'm an American, so I, I fear for this country specifically. Of course, of course. And I do too sometimes when I see, you know, certain things happen, but I, I, I want to be an optimist. Yes. The future world of um, uh, wall mm-hmm. I, I don't, <laughs> I don't want to believe in that as much as I want to believe in the future world of, did you see the movie Her? Oh, yeah. People keep recommending that to me. I've got yeah. to see that with uh, Joachim. Uh, Phoenix. Phoenix, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm not saying it's the best movie ever, but I really, really appreciated the way that they portrayed a future. You know, there, there's so many there's so many ways that we could go right now. I think we're at a, a crossroads for sure because the tech is moving so freakishly fast. Yes. And it's only going to move faster. So uh, I think we're at a crossroads and we have choices. So we could go down this corporate path, which is real scary and depressing. I'd like to think that we could go down a road that's more human. You know, I, I, yeah. I really want to believe that. And, and I'm going to fight to <laughs> try to make it so as much as I possibly can. Hey, I am too, Matthew. But you know what? I'm also... I'm hyper aware of what could be that you know dystopian future that scares me. Have you seen the movie? Um, uh, what's it called? Children of Men. It's a British film, right? Set right. in London, and it's like 2050 or something like that in the movie. So it's not that far in the future, but it's this dystopian future where they've rounded up people and put them in these camps, and a lot of the people are Pakistanis and people from foreign countries, and also the rebels, the fighters, and they have great civil war scenes, and it just seems so real the way that it's done. It seems so believable that it really frightens me and makes me really want to make those good choices like what you're talking about. Now when I hear things, when I hear all of this crazy talk when I hear Americans talking crazy stuff about Muslims and then you see these things on the news and all of a sudden you realize wow they're demonizing a massively large group of people yeah and trying to say that this massively large group of people because of their beliefs is you know mostly bad well you know intelligent people like me and you we know that that massive group of people that's maybe what I don't know a billion and a half people it's a lot of people right (laughs) Right. way more people than live in the United States it's like the United States times four or something you know but this massive group of people, we know the truth that 80% of those people, just like 80% of any group, right. are mothers and fathers with children, and they, they have the same goals that we do. They want to have 
you know, heat in the winter, and they want to have cool in the summer, and they want to have food on the table, and they want to have beds for their children, and they want to have education. They want the same thing. Of course, they're always going to be the 20% that are, you know, the troublemakers, like the politicians or the criminals, yeah. you know. Put, right. the, put those two the in the same. The yeah. fanatics. Put those two in the same 20%, you know, organized criminals, politicians, you know. And then, yeah. <laughs> and then of that 20%, you have, you know, the mafia dons and tyrants that rule countries and then you have the mass murders and so you know it goes down to a smaller and smaller percentage the crazier people get thank god it's not the other way around but the media yeah. tries to portray it as you know and i'm sure in other countries people say you know if you were a young person growing up in iran you might actually believe that everybody in the united states is evil sure you know despite what you'd seen in the hollywood movies that everybody all over the world has watched but that just wouldn't be true because yeah. again 80 percent of the people in the united states they want the same thing they want to have food for their children, et cetera, et cetera. So that just scares me to see this media blitz of let's hate this group of people. Like, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> you know, that's uh, crazy. <laughs> I think when some people listen to my podcast, they tend to think that I'm um, a pessimist. And I'm really not a pessimist. <laughs> I am a diehard optimist. To me, the glass is always, in my opinion, depending on how you look at the day when you wake up, the glass is really full. For many of us, the glass is completely empty. And that's really sad. But that is sad, yeah. for me and for all that I've been given and all the opportunities I've been given, you know, I have a home and I have a computer. That's huge compared to what people in the rest of the world have. They don't have. Yeah. You know? So I am so thankful every day when I find myself complaining, you know, standing in line at the post office and I realize, wow, I've been here 15 minutes. I right. th think, you know, man, you need to calm down and realize that I've got it so good compared to most. I remember yeah. my brother going to India and how he wanted to send a package back to the States. And he said, I swear to God, he said, between them wrapping it in this special brown paper and then take it to the next place to use a special kind of waxed string. <laughs> he said, I'm talking about six hours just to get the brown paper on the package. He said, I couldn't wow. even believe it. He said, they were not in any hurry he said i had to slow myself down he said i had to slow down my metabolism <laughs> so that i wouldn't lose it right but, wow yeah but it's crazy it's just crazy to think of how much we have for years my father always said we have more than the kings of old and yet we complain mm -hmm. you know we have a box that sits in another room and you open it up and it's cold part of it's cold and part of it's like the arctic you can yeah. you could kill a fish and put it in there as if you're in the arctic as if you're ice fishing i mean the kings of old didn't have that in the blazing heat of summer <laughs> you know i love that i mean we have so much and yet we complain it's unbelievable so i mean it's all relative of course of course but uh, but yeah i i think about that too you know even people that work jobs i mean man i used to be a janitor i used to be a bus driver i never had any money you know i mean that's just the way that i lived for many 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 years just yeah. one, one job to another job to another job and they were decent jobs and i made decent money but i never had a lot i don't have a lot now but back then there were years when i didn't even have a car i just rode the bus sure. you know and i remember living in small rooms and having room mates but you know i didn't think it was bad i didn't feel poor i enjoyed life and i enjoyed the things that i enjoy so i think that really it doesn't matter how much money you have I, I will tell you this man i do know some people that have a lot of money and i know some of those people are very very unhappy unhappy you yeah. know i'm thinking of one in particular and there's no way that he would ever even listen to this podcast so <laughs> I, I can i can say it but you know his relationships with his family and friends are just in shambles and he's just a miserable person and he is a multi wow. he's a multi-millionaire you know and i preach to him and i talk to him and i try to help him and, but he's just a miserable person and i think part of it's because he's got so much money and so many of his problems revolve around how does he deal with this piece of real estate and this investment and that he has his troubles all wrapped up in his wealth it's really right. it's really freaky to see man but <laughs> anyway i i, I yeah. know i know if i could go back to the days when i used to drive a bus and i was living in a small room and had roommates and i didn't even have a bank account i was just living in a cash world <laughs> i was so much happier i had so much less stress in my life yeah it's crazy yeah. I know. It's true. <laughs> and the listeners are wondering, like, what in the hell are these guys talking about? This has absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with Bitcoin. How can you bring it back, John? How can I bring it back? Um, let's see. 
Well, I think, you know, I think we've talked about everything under the sun. And, yes. and that's been a lot of fun. And I know that my listeners sometimes do just like to hear great conversation. I think that, you know, you and I are pretty good conversationalists. I think we've talked about some interesting things here Absolutely. on the show today. We can bring it back to Bitcoin by basically just saying, hey, the price has been down. What do you feel about the fact that the price has been down? Obviously, lots of people are saying, this is the end for Bitcoin. Yeah. It's all over. Right. And of course, you're intelligent enough to know that Bitcoin, the currency and the price thereof fluctuating and you know everyone calling out volatility and that's one of the evils of bitcoin but you're intelligent enough like i am to know that well that's not again that's not the technology you know you being a tech guy you know that that's not the blockchain that it's something very different but what would you say to my listeners in terms of the price of bitcoin being low right now and and whether or not that's even relevant to the overall tech behind bitcoin the protocol exactly i mean when i told people that i was going to be a part of this podcast they said one guy said, oh, well, you know, you know, the Bitcoin is really down right now. <laughs> and I said, yes, but I don't think that's the point. To me, I feel like the Bitcoin community in general is fighting this good fight. It is like a, a folk singer mentality of, of fight songs. People are creating this because there's a demand and a need for it. Yeah. I personally, I don't see the drop in it as being the death of it at all in any way because it has been created it exists now and so yeah. it will change of course and I, i'm sure that it will go back up but i feel like the main thing the main thing to focus on is that it it's it's here yeah. it's not going away and that to me is the fascinating thing about it the same guy who said oh it's really down he was talking to me about stocks yeah and he was saying that he has a few stocks and he's watched his he's watched his portfolio just go up and just plummet and then <laughs> up and plummet. And how, uh, you know, how different <laughs> is it? And, and I'm, not, I'm, not com I'm not comparing Bitcoin to, to anything, but I'm saying that is, isn't that just kind of life, period? Yeah. Uh, if, if the community is strong enough, if there are people out there that are willing to, again, like promote this thing that they care about. I mean, you know, maybe it is literally the end of Bitcoin. Right. The potential death of the currency. Out of the ashes of that, if that, if that goes away. Uh -huh, that's right. The tech is there and it's intact. The technology has been built. It will only get better. Yeah. That's the thing. It's like it will only get better. And, right. and more secure and more interesting. Yep, as it grows. I still think it's going to be the thing that people turn to. To me, it's like the technology has been built. And, and I feel like if, if real world finance and money were to crash, were to be taken down, yeah. there people have built these things. They've built them. Yeah, I think so, too. I, you know, I love the idea that... <laughs> Uh, Bitcoin is a little bit more mature and has the potential to bring a maturity and adult-like uh, persona to things like finance and to things like journalism. You know, I, I love that because we have gotten so Mickey Moused and so suckered into, you know, this is when I talk this way, people think I'm being negative. I'm not. I'm just talking about reality. Yeah. You know, we've been so suckered into accepting that this is censored, but we don't even call it censorship, you right. know, and I don't think that the film should have been censored. I think that someone no. in Hollywood, if they want to make a film about anybody being assassinated, I think they should have every right to do that. I don't think that they should buckle the terrorists. I also no. question whether or not it was the U.S. government saying, hey, look, we don't want you to put this movie out because it shows this actor having a lot of fun with the leader of North Korea. <laughs> right. You know, they're getting drunk together and going to strip clubs. We, right. don't, we don't like that because it kind of makes a comedy out of you know North Korea, and we may be planning to wage war on them like we plan to do a lot of times so we don't really want this movie to come out so what can you do to work with us sony and they got together in a little room and they said well let's just bring the story out that uh we've been hacked and mm -hmm. the terrorists are going to attack the theaters if we show it and they said okay the fed said that's fine go ahead and do that we appreciate that you know maybe they gave them a bunch of money maybe they didn't maybe they just <laughs> yeah. said maybe they just said well now we won't kill you i don't know <laughs> I have no idea, but I mean, a comedy about that, and at the end, he gets blown up near a helicopter. It's not like it's a real-life depiction of an assassination or something like that. Of course not. I just think the whole thing's ridiculous, but I, I like the idea that Bitcoin really can bring an adult, mature way of thinking about different things that, you know, right now, 
we are really just kind of wallowing in baby talk and in silliness. You know, even when it comes to things like selling your house, you've got to go hire a realtor and then the realtor deals with another realtor and I'm the seller of the house and that person's the buyer, but the realtors don't let us talk to each other right. and we're not exactly sure. And then we've got to go through a title company and we've got to pay all these fees and closing costs. It's just so much bullshit yeah. <laughs> that we're so used to that. I like to think that Bitcoin can kind of take us up a notch to be a little bit more honest, to have a little bit more responsibility for what we do, yeah. and to be a little bit more mature in our dealings, in our business dealings, and in our personal dealings. More human. More human, that you'll be known by yeah. your reputation as you are mm -hmm. in your neighborhood on your street, more so than known by whatever you do that's flashy or whatever you do that is played a million times over the television set so that people end up buying it. You'll be known more by right. your reputation, and, and I think we can have a renaissance uh, in this country where the movement slows down and eventually stops that seems to me to be making people dumber and dumber. I think that we can reverse that. I think mm -hmm. that we can start to get smarter and smarter mm -hmm. because as it is right now, we've got some real dum-dums in this country. And if you're, listen <laughs> if you're listening and you're a dum-dum, you probably don't even know it. But, you know, <laughs> the dum-dums are the ones who have been who have been kept from education, who have been kept in an impoverished situation. It's not necessarily their fault, you know. Yeah. They are the children of the people who were kept from this and their children and their children. And it's frightening, but I really think we can reverse that trend. And I think that Bitcoin can help play a part in, in terms of information and how information is moved from person to person and uh, the ease at which it's moved and the honesty at which information is put out there without so much misinformation, yes. candy coating and, yep. um, and propaganda. Exactly. That's well, my hope. <laughs> really well said. That and I, I was thinking the, <laughs> the hipster movement yeah. <laughs> gets so much flack, but there's a real true element to it that is that sort of trying to take it back, you know? Yeah. Going back to older things and to learn about older things. I can have a conversation. Yeah. You know, I could press this button and send and send you a tip. Yeah. <laughs> with using Bitcoin. And that's that human thing yeah. that you're talking about. And Absolutely. I, do. I agree with you. I'm all for it. I think the tide can be and will be turned. Yeah, I like yeah. it, man. And you know yeah. what? I think I love your optimism. And, you know, I think that uh, I'm going to have to be in that group of people that are trying to get you and your wife to come to Nashville. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. After this one podcast. That's, that's right. That's really. <laughs> so now, I love that. Yeah. So, I'm, you know, but I told you before, I thought, no, actually, what I told you before was, you know, there's probably a lot more going on in Chicago that you might be interested in, um, you know, in terms of entertainment, in terms of theater and all of that. It's a little bit slow going here. I think it's coming. But then on the other hand, we need good people to come here to, right. to bring more culture to this town than what we actually have. I really think Nashville has been so mired, bogged down by the music business for so yeah. many years that, uh, you know, people have just kind of stood by and watched historic buildings being torn down and they slacked on building a symphony hall they only got one built over the past five years they slacked on building a library and they finally got one built you know while other cities in the united states close to here had all of those things for 50 or 100 years sure. we're, we're just getting some things that we should have had a long time ago it's kind of sometimes i feel like people in nashville have been asleep at the wheel and that's a little bit it disturbs me a little bit living here because of that because i see the vibrance when i go to other cities and when i talk to other people i see the vibrance there i see the culture and i think man we just got to get more of that here so that's right. all, uh, once again, to say we need people like you to come here. <laughs> yeah, and the flip side of what, you, of what you're saying is that perhaps Nashville is the perfect example of what you are talking about. This, this city that maybe rests on its laurels and started getting really too far down that corporate, that corporate mentality and the lack of, lack of human yeah. <laughs> connection and yeah. is taking, taking it back. And, yeah. is, and that's what I felt when I, when I visited this time because it, I wasn't there for business for the first time. It was about excitement. Yeah. So, I, yeah, I dig it. I dig it. <laughs> so you're thinking about it, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Cool, man. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Hey, listen, man, it's been great talking to you. We're going to have to do it again in a couple of months, I imagine. Absolutely. And, Anytime. Uh, definitely when you're in Nashville, definitely look me up and we'll definitely go out and have a pint of beer together. I would love that. I would love that. Cool, man. Well, Matthew, say hi to Chi-Town for me 
And uh, what is that they say in that Chicago accent? Like they, I, I dated, I dated this girl years ago, and she called me Jan. Hey Jan. Hey Jan. I, hey Jan. Go down to Ashland and get a couple of hot dogs. <laughs> <laughs> I think what she used to say was, "I miss Chicago. We used to go to the tap of the cack." I said, "What used to go to the tap of the cack? What does that mean?" And she's saying, "Oh, we used to go to the top of the cock, which is the top of the John Hancock building, yep. to, to get a drink, right, or to oh, get yeah. dinner, right." <laughs> Man. <laughs> Which is pretty magical, I have to admit. Yeah, man. I've been there. I love it. I love Chicago. What a great city, man. I mean, that's a real city, man. It's a real city. If you guys could just get rid of that Rahm Emanuel, you guys will be <laughs> you guys will okay. be back to doing something really, really good there, man. Get get maybe rid of Maybe Rahm, maybe the winter, and maybe a little bit of the traffic. It would be paradise on earth. <laughs> get rid of that nine fingered bastard and let's let's move on. Let's move on with progress, man. I, I know that I love the fact my my friend who's an educator there in Chicago, the educators a while back when he was trying to do his funny stuff with the schools, they just slapped him. They bitch slapped him in the streets of Chicago. It's just so sweet. It's like, Rom, you've been bitch slapped by the teachers in yeah. Chicago. So, you know, Rom, don't mess with the teachers in Chicago. I was stupid. Move on. Go back to Washington, man. You yeah. know, go back to the cesspool from whence you came. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Rom, if you're listening, man, I'm, I, I don't mean it, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> hey, anyway, <laughs> you've been listening to a lively conversation with Matthew Bivens there in Chicago. Matthew, thank you so much for being on the show. Absolutely. Thank you, John. Hey, Merry Christmas to you. And Merry Christmas to you. Thank you, sir. Hey, have fun caroling out there. I will. I will. Uh, oh, I wish I was there with you guys, man. Wassailing, right? I hope you don't uh, don't get too wassailed, man. I won't. Next, <laughs> next year, you'll join us. I will, man. Absolutely. All right. <laughs> All right, Matthew. Thanks, John. Thanks. Take care, man. Bye. Bye. I know that it may sound absurd, but I have for you a magic word. And today's magic word is Christmas. C-H-R-I-S-T-M-A-S. Christmas. As in the sentence, Ho, ho, ho. Merry Christmas, everyone. This is Santa Claus. I hope everyone's been good boys and girls this year. Santa's going to bring you everything your little heart desires. Ho, 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 ho. Merry Christmas, everybody. Merry Christmas. Oh, there's no place like home for the holidays. Cause no matter how far Yeah, I know. I got to get to work. Got to put together something for the show, right? Yeah, I know that. Maybe I should grab some sound effects and just have a make-believe conversation with myself. How's that sound? No? Okay, then tell me what to do, genius. Max, you're the co-host of this show. You can't just sit there scratching your butt, okay? Just give me an idea of what I could do for the show, please. No, I'm not going to dance. This is an audio podcast, dude. No one would even see that. What? Yeah, I hear that too. What is that, Hawkeye? I mean, Max? It sounds like a helicopter. It sounds like it's right over the house. Like it's right on top of us. They're coming for us, Max. They're coming for us. Max, they're coming for us. Run for your life. Run for your life, Maxwell. To the tunnel. To the tunnel. Max, you can come back now. Max! Max! Max, come back! Well, there you are. You're safe. Thank God. Who is it, Max? Who's at the door? What? You're kidding me. Are you sure? It's the middle of the night. What would he be doing here? Oh, I know that knock. Seamus McCurdy! <laughs> I can't believe it! Well, if it ain't John Boy Walton! Oh my God. Good to see you, you John Boy! You scared the shit out of me! Uh, John Boy, I didn't mean to scare you! Oh my God! Oh, Seamus! It's great to see you, lad! <laughs> 
Oh my god, I swear to god, you almost gave me a heart attack. Ah. Oh man. Your ticker's fine, John, not to worry. <laughs> Good to see you, Seamus. Good to see you too, John. Oh, thanks, man. Hey, have a seat. You remember oh. Max, right? <laughs> oh. oh, yeah. Oh, hello there, Maxwell. Oh, he is happy to see you, man, and so am I, brother. Oh, thank you, John, boy. Oh, yeah. Ooh. Oh, it's nice and warm in here. It's cold up there. Oh, I'm sure it is. You were up in the helicopter. You know, I didn't know helicopters didn't have heaters. <laughs> and I almost burned me balls off rappelling down the road. <laughs> You're killing me, Seamus. Come on, seriously, uh, what were you doing in that helicopter? You almost gave me a heart attack in Maxwell, oh, too. Oh, poor little Maxwell. Oh, come here. Yeah, look oh, at him. Oh, come here, little oh, Maxwell. Oh. Oh, that's a good boy. I didn't mean to scare <laughs> Dude, you. Dude, at least take the helmet off. Seriously, he, he does. I don't even think he knows who you are. Ah, oh, you're wrong there, John. How could Maxwell ever forget the scent of his old mailman? I think Max is getting that mailman look in his eyes. Seriously. Oh, sorry, John. Sorry, Max. Oh, no worries, man. Hey, so anyway, Seamus, tell me, where did you get the helicopter? Oh. And where have you been? Ah, oh. You just disappeared. We had no idea where you went. I mean, oh. my new mail carrier, she's always late. She bends the mail. Max doesn't like oh. her. I hate yeah. to hear that, John boy, but I thought you'd heard. I quit me job a few months back. I sold all me bitcoins, and I took a holiday to Dublin to see me mum. Oh, man, I, I didn't know you'd quit. I didn't know you went to Ireland. That's great you got to see your mum, but you sold all your bitcoins. I, I thought you just had a few. How'd you uh, get to... uh, You're right, John. I had just a few thousand. I had 5,000. I sold at 350. 5,000 at 350? Are you kidding me? You sold 5,000 bitcoins at 350? Seamus, you're a bitcoin millionaire. That's right, John, and I'm still the same old Seamus. I always was. <laughs> haven't changed a bit. Except you're flying around in helicopters and selling bitcoins at 350. I mean, don't you think bitcoin's going to go higher than 350? You could have doubled your money if you'd waited. Huh, if I'd waited, if I'd waited, John Boy, me grandfather Patrick McCurdy, gave me these words of wisdom before he went to meet his maker. He said, Seamus, if you've got one foot in yesterday and one foot in tomorrow, you're shitting all over today. <laughs> John Boy, I've been a postman 30 years now, and I've had enough, lad. The sky is blue today, but it may not be tomorrow. Who am I to say? Yeah. A bird in the hand, and I'm a free man. Hey, Seamus, I think you did great, man. I just have to say, I I'm a little bit envious. I oh, mean, I'm John. tired of being broke. I'm tired of paying. Look at that stack of utility bills over there, two inches thick. I mean, I don't know, man. Just day after day, week after week, month after month. John. This American dream, I have to tell you, Seamus, oh, this yeah. American dream is killing me. Ah, oh, John boy, you're a young man. You should <laughs> thank God every day when you wake up that you have something to do that day that must get done. The work you do to Today, John, will build in you a thousand virtues the idle never know. Mm. Your ship will come in as long as you're at the helm, John, and your moral compass to lead the way. Thanks, Seamus. I've got a world of faith in you, John boy. Just make sure you're having that same faith in yourself. Thanks, Seamus. I know you're right. I mean, I don't begrudge your wealth or your happiness in any way at all. You're a friend. That's right. We're friends for life, John. Oh, thanks, Seamus. Yeah, man, we've known each other over 20 years. I guess I just hope that something like that happens to me. I, I just hope that I'm not always broke. Ah, John boy. Don't worry so much. You've got to have faith in yourself, first and foremost. Mm -hmm. That's the most important thing in life. Yeah, you're right. And now, John and Max, I must be on me way, if me clock is serving me right. Well, you just got here. Mary should be here to pick me up any minute. Mary? We're flying down to the Cape tonight, and then off to South America. Mary's flying the helicopter? To be honest with you, John, I'm tired of white people. John, take care of Maxwell. And Maxwell, take care of John. But you all be good. <laughs> Keep your noses clean. And remember, gentlemen, much of life is an illusion. I'll be seeing you down the road, John Boy. Love your show. Listen to it last week on the beaches of Waikiki. What a great island that is. The women, the new house, the lays. <laughs> Merry Christmas to you, John and Max. And a happy new year. Goodbye, Seamus. I'll miss you, man. You're the best damn mailman a guy ever had. Merry Christmas, Seamus. And happy new year. And God bless us, everyone! God bless us, everyone!
Now climb aboard, y'all. This train is bound for glory. And there's plenty of room for all. Well, Satoshi Nakamoto, that's a name I love to say. And we don't know much about him, but he came to save the day. When he wrote about the way things are and the way things are to be, he gave us all a protocol this world had never seen. A Bitcoin as you're going into the old blockchain. A Bitcoin, I know you're going to rain, going to rain. Till everybody knows, everybody knows, till everybody knows your name. We'll be told about the death of old Mount Gox About traders trading altar coins And miners mining blocks But them good old boys back in Illinois And on down through Tennessee See, they don't care to be a millionaire They're just wanting to be free A Bitcoin as you're going into the old blockchain A Bitcoin, I know you're going to rain, going to rain Till everybody knows, everybody knows Till everybody knows your name While the bankers count our money out for every government Oh, Bitcoin flies on through the skies of virtuality A promise to deliver us from age-old tyranny Oh, Bitcoin, as you're going into the old blockchain Oh, Bitcoin, I know you're going to rain, going to rain Everybody knows, everybody knows, till everybody knows your name. Till everybody knows, everybody knows, till everybody knows your Give me some exposure. Everybody knows your name. Sing it. Oh Lord, pass me some more. Oh Lord, before I have to go. Oh Lord, pass me some more. Oh Lord, before I I'd like to thank my guest on the show today, Matthew Bivens, formerly of Jump Little Children. Matthew, thank you so much for being on the show. And if you'd like to get in touch with Matthew, please check out the show notes on the Let's Talk Bitcoin Network or check out the show notes on SoundCloud. You can find out all about how to get in touch with Matthew and the great projects that he's involved in. I'd also like to thank everyone's good friend, Santa Claus, for being on the show today. Santa, you've got your work cut out for you and we're behind you all the way. And finally, I'd like to thank my good friend, and Seamus McCurdy. Seamus, wherever you are, brother, I hope that you and Mary are having the time of your lives. Merry Christmas, everyone. And now, an important question for all you small business owners and startups out there. Do you have a business that needs more exposure? Do you want to increase your customer base and increase your profits? Here's something to think about for your business. This podcast you're listening to right now, Bitcoins and Gravy, has over 10,000 weekly listeners and is heard each week in over 30 different countries around the world. The Bitcoin sphere is expanding exponentially, and Bitcoins and Gravy is expanding in pace with this relatively new technology. So as our listener base grows, so does the potential for your business to reach more and more customers here in North America, South America, Europe, Asia, and around the globe. To find out how to advertise on Bitcoins and Gravy, just email me at the following address. Howdy at bitcoinsandgravy.com. That's howdy, H-O-W-D-Y, howdy at bitcoinsandgravy.com. I can produce for you a high-quality 30-second spot or a one-minute spot for your business 
right here at the Treehouse Studio in Nashville, Tennessee. The cost of these ads is very affordable, and because everyone knows I'm a nice guy, I am always willing to work with your budget. Creative advertising strategies and packages are available. Listen, advertising does work. Otherwise, people wouldn't do it, right? Do something nice for your business by pushing it forward and taking it to the next level. If you've enjoyed the show today, please take a minute to leave a comment on Let's Talk Bitcoin in the comments section right there below the show notes. You can also leave a message on SoundCloud or do the old-fashioned thing and send me an email. And of course, Bitcoin and Litecoin tips are always appreciated by the hardworking writers and podcasters in the Bitcoin world. Many of us work as volunteers and sure could use those tips. You can send me $5 or $0.05 cents and I will be just as happy knowing that this podcast put a smile on your face or made your day a little bit better. Signing off now from East Nashville, Tennessee, I'm your host, John Barrett, with my trusty companion, Maxwell, by my side. Say goodbye, Maxwell. Y'all be good to each other out there now, and remember, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men and women to do nothing 